My name is Andrew Musgrave, and I am the Director of Social Justice and Outreach for the uh, Catholic churches that are over on this side of town, so the Three Holy Women, Saints Peter and Paul, Our Lady of Divine Providence, and Old St. Mary's. So we all work together, and I do social justice and outreach. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you all uh, who live here for hosting us here at this event. It's great to be in your, in your space and uh, be in this beautiful room. And I uh, want to let you know this is our sixth and final of our uh, six talks all about human dignity. Uh, earlier, or throughout this month, we've had five other talks that all dealt with different aspects of Catholic social teaching. And uh, this is our, our final one. And uh, I spoke with Dave Fulcher and Amy O'Connor, and they were gracious enough to host us here. So we had one in each of our parishes and then uh, doing one here. So we're very grateful again to be here and uh, hope this uh, goes as well as our previous five. And given the speaker, I'm, I'm sure it will. So um, if you get a chance, just before I forget, if you didn't sign in on your way in, if you would on your way out, sign in just so we can keep track of numbers and uh, follow up with anybody who might be interested in, in uh, following up with more of this kind of social justice mumbo jumbo we do here and uh, this this great hidden treasure of the Catholic Church. So uh, if you do that, I appreciate it. Obviously there's some food in the back, so help yourself for some snacks. And uh, on that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over. Uh, our speaker tonight is Brother John Selahowski. He is a Capuchin priest, uh, a good friend of mine, known him for about a dozen years since I've been involved in Milwaukee. I was very fortunate to actually run into him uh, at a conference at Marquette Law School uh, on restorative justice. He lived down in Chicago, but he was there for the conference, and I told him about this, and he said it sounded interesting, and that was my end to say, so, what made it more interesting is if you were speaking. And uh, he graciously agreed to do so, so he came up here to do this talk, so we're very grateful to have him John here to talk about um, uh, Vatican II and Pope Francis. So now I'll turn over to John. So. It's uh, good to be back in my hometown in Milwaukee and to see a, a number of familiar faces. Uh, this is a very special opportunity for me to be here uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first of which is uh, I grew up only about five blocks from here at uh, 2937 North Stoll Avenue. Uh, and I uh, was a member of uh, St. Peter and Paul Parish. We used to call it St. Pete's. I don't know how we dropped St. Paul out of it, but, uh, <laughs> but we did. Uh, and went to the grade school there. And um, so my grandmother was actually a resident here uh, for a number of years uh, before she, she passed away. We had her funeral here. So it's a, a very uh, good moment for me to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, I'd, I'd like to just uh, give you a, a few more words of introduction. Also, um, those of you who are my former parishioners at St. Benedict's or St. Martin de Porres, you can nod off for a couple minutes while I do this introduction. But uh, <clears throat> I, um, after growing up here in Milwaukee, I um, uh, went away uh, to um, high school at St. Lawrence Seminary, which is our still uh, one of the, I think, three remaining high school seminaries that are left in the United States, which of course is run by the, the Capuchin Order. Um, graduated from there and then went away to college, um, began in our formation program, um, got my Master of Divinity degree from Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, and then uh, two weeks after that I was named pastor of a parish on the south side uh, and was there for four years uh, before uh, my province asked me to go away for further studies. Um, got a law degree at, at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C., uh, and came back here to Milwaukee in 2000. Uh, and then for the next eight years, um, in addition to uh, practicing, practicing some law, I was pastor of uh, two parishes here in the city. First at St. Uh, Benedict de Moor, uh, Ninth and State, and then at St. Martin de Porres, what used to be called St. Elizabeth's at Second and Burleigh. In 2008, I was elected to serve as a provincial minister for our Midwest province of Capuchins and uh, completed my two terms, thanks be to God. Uh, in, uh, 20, in 2014, um, spent about uh, two months in our mission uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, and then um, took a little bit of a sabbatical before uh, I was appointed to serve as a formation director for our students, uh, philosophy and theology students in Chicago, as well as our continuing formation program. Um, I've been involved with justice and peace work throughout my life as a friar. 
uh, both in the educational side, um, in the advocacy uh, side, uh, and then also um, uh, through work through organizations like the uh, Interface Center for Corporate Responsibility, um, through the Justice and Peace um, Commissions of the Capuchins, uh, both in the provincial level and on the international level. I'm currently serving as the pres uh, president of the uh, of the uh, International Justice, Peace, and Integrity of Creation Commission for the Capuchin Order, uh, and was just in Rome earlier this month for our for our meetings, uh, and then. Um, continue to be involved in, in direct work as well. Uh, I'm the chair of the board of the uh, St. Labre Indian School of Board of Directors. Uh, and so very interested in that. I had a privilege last week of being out in, in Ashland, Montana for not only for a board meeting, but more importantly for the graduation of uh, the students at St. Labre. And I'm very proud to say that uh, one of them is going to Dartmouth and another one is going to Yale. Um, the first uh, graduate of St. Labre to ever go to Yale. So say a prayer for Sophie Schindler, uh, who is the, uh, the uh, valedictorian this year. And, uh, but she, she'd do well there. Um, so the uh, topic for our, our discussion tonight is social dimensions of evangelization. And I'm trying to frame it uh, in the fourth chapter of Pope Francis's apostolic exhortation, Evangelii Gaudium. Uh, for those of you who may not have studied Latin uh, or may have forgotten it a little bit, that means uh, the joy of the gospel. Uh, and uh, as, as you know, when we speak of Latin uh, titles of church documents, um, very often encyclicals, apostolic exhortations, um, certainly um, even in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, uh, the um, uh, pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world is gallium et spes, um, joys and hopes of the, of the people of God and, and so on are the joys and hopes of the church as well. So, Evangelii Gaudium, chapter four, and the principles of Catholic social teaching. That's the title of the talk. So what are these principles? I'd like to kind of frame this up first. So the, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the USCCB, um, speak of uh, seven different uh, principles of Catholic social teaching. The first and the most obvious for us, is, and certainly as you look at the activities of the bishops in the areas of uh, abortion and stem cell research, research etc., is life and the dignity of the human person. Uh, we also see this in, in play in issues like uh, opposition to the death penalty. Today in uh, Nebraska, the state legislature uh, overrode the governor's veto and uh, declared outlawed um, uh, capital punishment in the state of Nebraska. <laughs> Another important element of the uh, principles of Catholic social teaching is the call to family community and participation. And this will be on display very prominently uh, later on this year in, in September when uh, they had the uh, gathering for the Synod of the Family uh, in Philadelphia. And the Holy Father will be here, of course, for that. Rights and responsibilities is another important principle. And I think especially for us in, in our own country, because we live in a, in a culture that is very dominated by rights. Everybody has a right to this and a right to that. We speak of constitutional rights and social rights and so on. But we often forget that with those rights, we also have responsibilities. The option for the poor and the vulnerable. Um, just this past weekend, we celebrated uh, the beatification of Archbishop Oscar Romero. There was a huge mass in, in San Salvador, and he was one who spoke very powerfully about the option for the poor and the, and the vulnerable. The dignity of work and the rights of workers is, is an issue that is very prominent these days. Uh, just last weekend, in, um, in outside of Chicago, in Oak Brook, Illinois, there were a group of workers at McDonald's, corporate headquarters, for their annual meeting to um, promote um, higher wages, uh, base wages for the workers at McDonald's. And of course, I don't have to speak to you in Wisconsin about the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Those, those issues have been very much on display 
uh, with Governor Walker and Act 10 over the past number of, of years. Solidarity is the sixth of those seventh principles of Catholic social teaching. And that's the, and I'll get into a little bit more detail about that as I get into the, uh, the talk on uh, Pope Francis's uh, apostolic exhortation because he goes into uh, quite a bit of detail about, about solidarity. And then of course, care for God's creation, uh, care for nature, and of course we're blessed here in Wisconsin and particularly in Milwaukee to be living next to uh, one of the Great Lakes. And uh, Pope Francis, uh, in about a month and a half or so, he'll be uh, releasing his uh, encyclical uh, on uh, the environment. And of course, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest in that document. So the uh, Evangelii Gaudium was released in uh, 2013 uh, in December. I remember it very well because uh, as soon as it was released, I happened to be down in uh, Bluefields, Nicaragua, um, celebrating the 100th anniversary of the, um, of the uh, church, uh, the, the setting up of the diocese and, and, and things in Managua. And I was in uh, Bluefields, Nicaragua with our Capuchin bishops uh, celebrating that. And the word came out about this wonderful apostolic exhortation. So I downloaded it onto my iPad. And as we were waiting to take our eight-seat plane from uh, Managua to, uh, to Bluefields uh, and praying that we would survive the flight, uh, I, we started to read this ex apostolic exhortation. Um, an apostolic exhortation um, does not have the same solemnity, excuse me, the same solemnity of um, teaching uh, that, for example, uh, 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 an encyclical, or certainly not um, a uh, document that's coming out of a uh, uh, ecumenical council, like the documents of Vatican II would have. But it is a letter that the Pope writes to, as the name implies, to encourage people to reflect on particular issues. And in this, um, apostolic exhortation, the Holy Father, Pope Francis, was really trying to uh, get people to understand and own the fact that we are all missionaries. That we are all called to be evangelists, proclaimers of the gospel of Jesus, according to, uh, by, first by virtue of our baptism, but also uh, according to the various gifts that we have. And, and just this past Sunday, we were uh, listening to um, the, um, the passage in, in many of the churches. That there were two options for that second reading, but, but one of them talked about, um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talked about the church as a body and how we all have different gifts uh, that come from the same spirit. So this apostolic exhortation is divided into five chapters. First, uh, the begins the church's missionary transformation. It, it then explores uh, in some depth uh, the crisis of communal commitment. And the Pope talks about how this is witnessed in different places of the world. He then speaks very directly about the proclamation of the gospel. And in this particular chapter, in chapter 3, he spends a lot of time um, talking about something that's become a, a great concern of his uh, during uh, his pontificate. And that is uh, preaching, the quality of preaching, and the, specifically the quality of homilies. Uh, when he was uh, um, speaking to a, a, a group of uh, newly ordained priests recently in Rome, his, his word was very strong. He said, don't preach boring homilies. Uh, uh, because he knows that that's, that's how so many people hear the word of, of God today. Um, the fourth chapter is the one that I'll be treating in some depth this, this evening, and that's the social dimension of evangelization. And then in the fifth chapter, he concludes by uh, sending us all forth to be spirit-filled evangelizers. So in chapter four, uh, again, this is a very long document. This is sections 177 to 258. I, I would encourage you, uh, if you get a chance, to um, go to the Vatican website, and you can download this document or read it off of the website yourself. 
it's, a, it's a very rich document. So what I'm giving you is just a little bit of a slice of it. So he begins the section um, by talking about uh, how the gospel evangelization has both a communal and a societal dimension and how there's repercussions uh, from the charisma. Now some of you may not know, know what that word means. It comes from two Greek words which mean to proclaim or to herald. And what the charisma is, is the essential core message of the gospel of salvation in and through Jesus Christ. Again, the charisma is the essential core gospel message of salvation in and through the person of Jesus Christ. He talks then about the uh, confession of faith and the commitment to society. That the gospel in its essence means life in a community and engagement with other people. He believes that, and he teaches that personal redemption cannot be separated from redeemed relationships. In other words, it's not just me and Jesus in the gospel. Uh, the gospel draws us into a relationship, relationship with each other, and as we'll be uh, discussing this coming Sunday when we celebrate the, uh, the um, solemnity of the Most Holy Trinity, that God, by God's very nature, as a triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, is communion. And we're, we're called to reflect that sense of communion, that power of love in communion in our own lives. And so that we, uh, the Pope then turns and invites us to uh, revive the original and sometimes radical meaning of the, the scriptures. He then turns to the kingdom of God or the reign of God and the challenges that it places uh, for our society. That the love of God, as it's been embodied not only in the uh, communion of the Trinity, but also in the person of Jesus, calls us and creates a fraternity of justice, peace, and dignity. And charity, not just for some, but for all. The church's teaching on social questions is the next topic of the, the Pope's discussion in this section. He begins by stating something that's very important for us here in the United States to, to remember. That religion cannot be relegated to the private sphere. We have this long tension in our country uh, over the separation of church and state, embodied, of course, in our First Amendment which has two parts, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. And there's this dynamic tension between them. And we have this, this tendency in our country um, to, to war, if you will, over how our faith is expressed in public life. Uh, the Pope is very strong in saying that we cannot uh, relegate our practice of our faith to just what we do within the walls of the church or within our homes. That it, that it draws us out of ourselves and into society. Now how that may look in society may differ uh, from person to person, but it cannot be something that's merely, merely private. He also mentioned something else, that the church can offer solutions, but it doesn't have all the answers. And he then takes those two principles and invites us to consider two of the primary issues of our time. Defending the poor and the issue of peace. Uh, probably where you've seen his defense of the poor to be the strongest is uh, in his home country in, in Italy. I mean, of course he's from Argentina, but where he lives now in Italy. When he's gone to this this uh, place called Lampedusa, and he has spoken so eloquently and powerfully about the basic dignity of migrants, 
all these people that are trying to come from the war-torn parts of, of the Middle East and, and Africa and, and trying to come to Europe to make a new way for their families. And many of them are risking their lives and losing their lives. And the Pope is, is very strong on this, this right to, to safe migration. Of course, legal, but, but also safe. And he's also been very strong in, in the area of, of trying to uh, create greater peace in the world as well. He then turns to uh, the issue of, more concretely, to the issue and the inclusion of the poor in society. In the union with God, he says, we hear a plea. First, that Christ became poor himself and was always close to the poor. St. Francis speaks of the incarnation as an example of the humility of God. The, and, and as St. Paul says in, in the second chapter of Philippians, um, that though he was in the form of God, Jesus didn't deem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather he emptied himself and took the form of slave. He became poor uh, to help redeem us. So Pope Francis wants to remind us that the Lord hears the cry of the poor. And every Christian, individually, and every Christian community, therefore, is called to be, and I'm quoting the Pope here, an instrument of God for the liberation and promotion of the poor and for enabling them to be fully a part of society. One implication of that is this idea of, of solidarity. And Pope Francis says of solidarity that it's more than just a few sporadic acts of generosity. It presumes creation, he says, of a new mindset which thinks in terms of community and the priority of the life of all over the appropriation of goods by a few. That it has to be lived as a decision to restore to the poor what properly belongs to them. That is the basic things that people need to, to live uh, a human life. Food, clothing, clean water, health care, things like that. And that if it's authentically lived, it will lead to the transformation of unjust or oppressive social and economic <coughs> structures and move toward the rec uh, recognition of fundamental human rights to education, health care, just wages, etc. But the Pope is not a socialist. He says very clearly in the same section that private property is justified and it's protected. But he also says that it's justified and protected insofar as it ultimately serves the common good. He then turns towards uh, fidelity to, to the gospel. That we need to be concerned not only uh, about avoiding falling into doctrinal error, but also about being remaining faithful to the simple and clear commands of Jesus in the, in the gospels. That we need to be concerned about the dangers of neo-paganism and a self-centered, what he calls a self-centered and materialistic lifestyle. And I think all you have to do is, is watch TV or, or things like that to see, see examples of that today. Pope Francis speaks of the special place of the poor among God's people. That God in Christ became one with the poor. That God's preferential option for the poor should mark one that is poor and for the poor and allows itself to be evangelized by them. Interestingly, though, when he speaks of the, um, the worst discrimination of the poor, he doesn't speak of anything material. He says the worst discrimination against the poor is a lack of pastoral care. Our preferential option for the poor, he says, 
must mainly translate into a privileged and preferential religious care. And what, what obligation does that place for us as a church? That means that, that the places where everybody else is fleeing, where businesses are fleeing, where other institutions are fleeing, those are precisely the places where the church needs to be. That's an implication of that privileged and preferential religious care. Uh, one of the ways in which uh, we're, we're trying to do that in my own province is, um, is on the Indian reservations in Montana. We've been, we've been ministering on the Northern Cheyenne and the Crow reservations for the last uh, almost 90 <coughs> years. And we recently made the decision to send more friars out there, to, to increase the size of our community out there as, a, as an expression of this, as in a strengthening of our, of our missionary commitment. Getting a little bit more concrete then about the inclusion of the poor in society, Pope Francis then turns towards the economy and the distribution of, of income. And he gets, uh, again, like I said, very, very concretely here. He says, he talks about the structural causes of poverty and how they have to be urgently addressed by society. He, he describes how the growing gap between rich and poor, not only in industrialized countries like the United States, but in other parts of the world, is steadily a weakening society and destabilizing society. He says that inequality is at the root of social ills. That economic policies must be rooted in the fundamental dignity of the human person and the pursuit of the common good. At the same time, again, he's not down on private property or on <laughs> capitalism. In fact, he says business can be, and I'm quoting him here, a noble vocation if it serves the common good by increasing the economic, social, and cultural goods of the world and making them accessible to all. And again, here he's really echoing um, the teachings of, of other popes who have gone before him, people like Pope John Paul II, who was very strong on this, on this vision as well, and Pope, Pope Benedict. He adds that we can no longer trust the invisible hand of the, the free market, that politics, too, can be a lofty vocation. Where have you ever heard that before? <laughs> Provided that it, too, serves the common good. And, and that the economy, the, the human economy, the, the practical economy that we, that we live in, and again I'm quoting here, should be the art of achieving a fitting management of our common home, which is the world as a whole. Making the world and the resources of the world uh, something that can be shared in equitably by all the people who live in the world. And in light of that, he then talks about concern for. First, he, and these are kind of abstract, and so I want to um, first mention the four principles and then get a little bit more into depth in them. First, he says that time is greater than space. He says unity prevails over conflict, that realities are more important than ideas. And I'm sorry I misspelled that. There should be an H there. A whole is greater than the part. Just wanted to make sure you were paying attention. <laughs> so time is greater than space. Pope Francis recognizes that we live in a world that has this dynamic tension uh, between fullness and limitation. And we need to invest the time necessary to create and implement processes that will transform society rather than looking at quick fixes. And that the same principles apply to evangelization and the need to uh, pay attention to the big picture and on long-term results. And so 
Um, he says that we need to really look at, at the, the world as a whole and at the work that we do as evangelizers, not just in the short-term results, but also in what happens long-term. When he discusses unity prevailing over conflict, he says that he says that conflict is not something that we should deny. In fact, he says conflict can have a constructive role in the world. It must be confronted, dealt with, and used constructively and creatively rather than being ignored or hidden. That within this conflict then, uh, there's a call to build communi communion amid disagreement. And that we don't make peace ourselves. Rather, we make real the peace that God made possible through the cross of Jesus. I was just uh, praying the, the liturgy, the hours before I walked in here this evening, I have it on my iPhone, my uh, breviary app. And I was praying the, 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 the liturgy of the hours, and it talked, uh, one of the um, canticles talked about Christ being this principle of unity between God and humanity, between life and, and death. And that the Holy Spirit then can harmonize this, um, this diversity, as I, mentioned, as I mentioned before and as we just celebrated at Pentecost. Realities, the Pope says, are more important than ideas. And if, if you've ever noticed in any of the writings of Pope Francis or, or, uh, list, or read some of his homilies as they're, they're published here and there, this Pope is very strong on making the, the principles and the teachings of, of Jesus and the teachings of the Church very concrete even though he's a Jesuit. He doesn't live in his head. He wants to be very concrete. He mentions that realities and ideas are in this, this uh, again, this dynamic tension. But that ideas, if we, if we just live in our heads, can mask realities. For example, in, in empty rhetoric or in uh, the sin of, of relativism. And that realities can sometimes dampen or discourage the working out of ideas. In other words, we can, we can look at the reality of, of, of a situation and, and we can lose the, the sense of hope that we have, the sense of dreaming that we have, because we get overwhelmed with the concrete. And so there has to be this dialogue back and forth between realities and ideas. And that Jesus, the Word made flesh, becomes the model for integrating ideas and realities. Word made flesh. And that he calls us to make the words of the Gospel real in the world here and now. Particularly, for example, through works of justice and charity. Turning then from that part, he then talks about how the whole is greater than the part. Just as ideas and realities are in tension, so the global and the local are in this dynamic tension. And we need to, to bring them into uh, some type of, of balance, lest we run the risk of either living in the clouds, in other words, just talking about things on kind of this global, broad level, or, on the other hand, falling into various forms of parochialism. In other words, thinking that the problems that we have in the United States are the, the most important problems for us to consider. He then turns to this, and this is where he gets a little... Uh, I get a little lost sometimes too, but he talks about, he uses this model of the polyhedron uh, as, a, as opposed to the sphere. And uh, the idea of this is that um, uh, 
there's not in a sphere, if you look at a ball, for example, every point on the surface of the sphere is an equal distant, equally distant from the, from the center. But in a polyhedron, it's, it's a little bit different. And uh, he uses this uh, to talk about how the, these different elements in the polyhedron um, come to points of convergence. And then they also draw into the center. And uh, that's, that's kind of the model that he uses. Uh, uh, that the genius of each people uh, receives in its own way the entire gospel and embodies its expressions of prayer, fraternity, justice, struggle, and celebration. In other words, that if we look, if we look at the world or we look at the church as a sphere, we assume that every part of the church um, is going to deal with things in the same way. There's a uniformity there. But what the Pope is driving at is, is pluriformity. That how the gospel is lived out is going to have certain fundamental commonalities and universalities, but it's also going to be lived out concretely uh, in different ways. And isn't that one of the, the fundamental teachings of the Second Vatican Council? That the church in her Catholicity is, is, is universal not only in the sense of being united, but also in being uh, pluriform. And, and the Pope uh, wants to, to emphasize that. He then turns to uh, social dialogue as, uh, as a contribution to peace. Pope Francis uh, tells us that evangelization involves and even demands a dialogue uh, between believers and the church and the people and institutions of the wider society. That the state, that is the government, has the responsibility to promote and maintain the common good, respecting the principles of subsidiarity, solidarity, dialogue, and consensus building. Again, some of those things that we've, we've talked about already uh, in the introduction on Catholic social teaching. But the church doesn't have the answers for everything, but it works with other social sectors to promote the common good and human dignity. The Pope also wants to uh, eliminate this uh, false uh, dichotomy of faith, uh, a split between faith and reason and science. Mm -hmm. The church, he says, is not hostile to science, but rather seeks, and I'm quoting him here, a synthesis between responsible use and methods proper to the empirical sciences and other areas of knowledge such as philosophy, theology, as well as with faith itself. And I think, um, just to tune you in a little bit, when you read, when you have a chance to read his encyclical on the environment, he's going to be speaking, as, as you probably read already, about the whole phenomenon of climate change. And he's going to be talking about the science uh, that has been presented and the scientific evidence that has been presented about climate change, and obviously there's, there's some differences there, but he's going to, to talk about how that science and the observations we've had of, of different phenomenon in the world um, and the, the impact that it's having on people in the world, uh, both currently and the potential impact that it's going to have, particularly on the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world, that, that that is an issue at the heart of the gospel. That the, the world that God gave us, the gifts that God has given us through the environment are gifts that we're called to, to nurture and sustain. And so, and, and so science and faith definitely are in dialogue on this issue of, of the environment. Something to keep in mind as you, as you read that encyclical. That the church, uh, he goes on to say in this section, 
has no desire to impede scientific progress, but it likewise cannot accept scientific dogmatism or absolutism that refuses to recognize other sources, paths, and dimensions of truth. In other words, just as it's wrong to say that the only truths in the world are religious truths, it's also wrong, on the other hand, to say that the only truths in the world are, are those that can be scientifically verified by the empirical method. That truth is, is something much broader than this either-or approach, and we need to find a way to integrate that. He then mentions the importance of ecumenical dialogue. That as the Christian community continues its pilgrim journey through history, we still seek to embody the hope of Jesus that all uh, who are followers of Christ may be, may be one. He talks about how divisions uh, among Christians in the world, particularly in some parts, make ecumenical efforts all the more uh, critical. And I think he's... Here he's especially speaking from his own Latin American experience where um, a church that was once very heavily Catholic is now in, in many countries divided uh, between Catholics and particularly evangelicals. Um, and you, you've seen the Pope himself reach out to evangelical Christians in, in Italy and Latin America. That we need to trust the Holy Spirit to work in various ways among groups and to work together in service and, and proclamation and witness. And then, um, because he, uh, this is also uh, this year, uh, 2015 is the 50th anniversary of Nostre Aetate, which speaks of the relations in particular with, with uh, the church and, and Jews. Um, the Pope emphasizes that the church holds the Jewish people in special regard because God's call and God's covenant are irrevocable. And the church, again, seeks a dialogue with, with the people of, of Judaism. And not only dialogue within the Christian community, not only dialogue with our uh, ancestors in the faith of Jews, but the Pope also wants to promote interfaith dialogue. That the church's dialogue with other religious traditions must be marked by, by openness and love, as well as the proclamation of the truth as it's been revealed to us. That true openness, he says, and I'm quoting him here, involves remaining steadfast in one's own deepest convictions, clear and joyful in one's own identity, while also seeking <clears throat> understanding of the other and trusting that dialogue can enrich everybody. He particularly speaks of dialogue, uh, the importance of dialogue with the Muslim community. And he notes how this dialogue, in order to be effective, is going to require uh, greater training and preparation, as well as an avoidance of what he calls, and again I'm quoting in here, hateful generalizations. Uh, about Muslims. <laughs> and that non-Christians, if they're sincere and live according to their consciences, can also be blessed by God's grace. And then finally, he concludes this fourth section of Evangelium Gaudium by talking about social dialogue in a context of religious <laughs> freedom. If Again, if you read many of the Pope's uh, statements and, and homilies, he speaks very powerfully of this need to protect the rights of Christians throughout the world. And, and of course, particularly, we see this on display in the Middle East. I was just down in, um, when I was in Chicago a couple weeks ago, uh, <coughs> helping out at, at, a, at a parish that I was pastor of. They had a, a display of um, articles uh, that were made in Bethlehem by Christians in the Holy Land. And the young lady who was uh, selling these items that are made out of olive wood, um, little crosses and nativity sets, etc., she mentioned that the Christian community uh, 
in uh, in Palestine is now down to less than one percent. Mm -hmm. The birthplace of Jesus now has less than one percent of its inhabitants are followers of Jesus. Something we need to to be aware of. So we at the same the, the, the religious freedom whether it's here in our own country or anywhere else in the world, promotes a healthy pluralism and a social dialogue. And that Christians can live and work in harmony with those who even don't believe in God, even, even atheists or, or agnostics, but still seek truth and goodness and beauty. And with that... Um, take this time to first uh, thank you for your attentiveness and then uh, to uh, invite any dialogue or comments or questions that people may have. Thank you very much. This again is an apostolic interpretation, which is a little bit different. But when the Pope writes an encyclical, depending on the area that he's going to be writing in, he'll generally tap the particular um, congregation or pontifical council that would be responsible for that area. So, for example, in his upcoming encyclical, he has drawn very much uh, on the expertise of people in the pontifical council for justice and peace, Cardinal Peter Turkson of um, Ghana, West Africa, uh, is, is the head of that sacred congregation. And uh, so the Pope has been drawing from there. But of course, when, uh, when he does that, and the Pontifical Just Council of Justice and Peace has, has scientists and, and religious authorities from all over the world on that council as well. So very often what they'll do is, is they'll have meetings uh, of, of various kinds um, they'll host conferences, they'll hear from people, uh, they get those different opinions, and then the Pope, uh, well, his staff generally will write the document, and then the Pope will, will uh, go into editing it and trying to put his own voice to it. Yeah. But uh, these, I think, I believe they are all still released in Latin, uh, which is still the official language of the church. And then they get translated all into all these other languages. So if you wanted to read it in its original Latin, you could probably try. But there will be other languages available very quickly. And that's that's the other thing. This this document has probably been ready for some time, but uh, they're they're in the process of preparing all the different translations that will be that will be used. Uh, and because they want to, when it gets released, obviously there's going to be huge. Um, attention paid to it, and so they want to make sure that the um, the translations are are uh, as close to the, the Latin as possible, which is the same principle they use to translate the um, liturgical books. Yes, John, when you look at the, the Pope's emphasis on the poor. Sorry. Okay, the Pope's emphasis on the poor and Catholic social teachings. I think. Um, he has certainly captured the interest of uh, other non-Catholic Christians as well as non-Christians around the world. I mean, he's become a bit of a, a superstar. Uh, yet, I think if you poll most Catholics around the world, 99% um, will probably couldn't tell you what Catholic social teachings are or that they have any you know, responsibility according to those. And so my question is, um, will he be successful in kind of turning on Catholics to this whole um, social teachings to, to take a, an active part in it? Do, do you see that transformation happening? Well, he's 78 years old, so he uh, doesn't have a whole lot of time uh, but I, I think he, I think he is. I think he's really. Um, maybe, this maybe this isn't the best place to say that. 
as I was saying, I'm sure he has at least 20 more years. Uh, and said he's a baby. Yeah, he's a baby. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just going by what I, what I read. Uh, but um, yeah. But um, you know, I think, I think he's got some heavy lifting to do um, uh, because these, these principles have been around in one form or another, you know, for decades. And um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the church uh, in different parts of the world, certainly in our own country, I think, um, you know, has, has placed a particular F, uh, focus on, on certain issues uh, that are part of the Catholic social teaching, certainly part of the Catholic social teaching, um, and not emphasize others. And, uh, and so I think it's, it's more a question of trying to bring them all into, into balance. And again, where you are in the world will also determine um, how these issues are, are brought out. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the issues um, relating to the option for the poor and the vulnerable, those have been very strong in Latin America for many years. Um, not as strong here in the United States for various reasons. Uh, so I think, I think he's, he's got a lot of work to do. A lot's going to depend on um, how, how well he's able to um, uh, utilize uh, uh, the, the efforts that he's making right now to reform the, the Korea uh, and to decentralize things um, so that he can make a better use of the bishops' conferences and the bishops' conferences themselves themselves have more latitude in terms of how to emphasize different things in different parts of the world according to what the needs of the people are in that particular part of the world. Um, you know, I think that's all going to play out over time. Uh, but his efforts to reform the Korea right now are, are I think, are going to have a significant impact on that. Yes? I grew up with corporal works of mercy. Mm -hmm. that we needed to be aware of the people that didn't have what we had. And we didn't have much. Right. It was during the Depression. We didn't have a car. So we would take the streetcar mm -hmm. to funerals. And I remember my dad visiting fellas from World War I and going on the streetcar over to the Veterans Hospital, which was a long way mm -hmm. to go on a streetcar in those days. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was just wondering why Pope Francis doesn't mention some of the works that the Catholic Church has done for centuries mm -hmm. in feeding people, healing people, educating people, clothing people, mm -hmm. housing people. I mean, right here in Milwaukee, we have a very active St. Vincent de Paul mm -hmm. society. And you know, these are just comments that I'm not going to choose as a question. I'm just, I'm just raising my opinion. Here. Sure. And I, and I think, uh, you know, to be fair to him, this, this particular um, apostolic exhortation um, doesn't denigrate the works of, of corporal works of mercy or charity. He does emphasize justice in trying to deal with the, the structural causes and things like that. But he has, in other writings, been very strong about talking about charity. In fact, he's put his money where his mouth is. He um, converted part of um, uh, the... Uh, center at, uh, at St. Peter's in Rome to make showers for the homeless. Uh, he renovated part of the, the visitor center to make uh, showers for the homeless. And so he is, he is trying to, to exemplify that in his own, his own way. Um, but yeah. Yes, sir. I believe the, uh, I think this is a perfect lead into what I wanted to say anyway. I am a member of St. Vincent de Paul. I have been for a number of years. I learned it from my grandfather 60 years ago. And uh, we and many others are very able and interested in helping. And we, you know, just had a meeting yesterday, we were dealing with several clients, etc. But there's a four letter word called advocacy. <laughs> which seems to stop people in their tracks. Right. They, it's, it's good to give them a meal, it's good to do this, and then you can kind of walk away. And that, I think, getting over that bridge of being out there 
tutoring his schools, uh, helping with jobs, things of that nature. I think that leads somewhat in this direction, but that's not the end of it. It's a very good point. Thank, thank you. Yes, sir. How did you get involved in the captions? How did I get involved in the captions? It's a, it's an interesting story. My dad, my dad was a dentist. Uh, he went to Marquette here, and um, he had a dental practice on 19th and Atkinson uh, for about 10 years, and um, uh, ended up with a lot of patients who were captions. Uh, uh, Michael Crosby and Richard Hart and those guys. I didn't even know who they were. Um, but um, the real reason how I got mixed up, if you want to call it that, with the captions, <laughs> is um, uh, I, was, uh, I was interested, uh, I, I probably had my first calling to be um, a priest when I was in the, in the, in the first grade. Um, and uh, I really admired the priests that we had at St. Peter and Paul, Monsignor Groster, and Father Scherer, Father Janicki, and those guys. Um, and then Father McAvoy, Father Mac over at Marquette, um, who was a great friend to my dad and a lot of the students there. Um, and Father Grappi as well. My mother, I don't know what possessed her to do it, but she took, she took me on, on a march uh, with Father <laughs> Grappi. Uh, and so, and, and we had priests and religious in, in both sides of our family. Father Monsignor Sela Husky was uh, the pastor of St. Cyril and Methodius on 13th and Wind Lake for I think close to 30 years. Uh, and uh, so it was kind of in the blood, if you will, but it all happened by, by accident, really. Um, I, I was interested in the priesthood, and I, was, I wanted to go to a minor seminary in Michigan, and my dad thought that was too far away for a 13-year-old or 14-year-old to go. So he was cleaning the teeth of my, <laughs> or, or doing a dental exam of my uh, fourth grade basketball coach uh, who, ha who happened to have a son who was a Capuchin. Uh, and he said, hey, hey, have you ever heard of this school near Fond du Lac called St. Lawrence Seminary? Uh, and uh, I went up for a weekend visit, and then my two other brothers went up uh, later on, and we all, all three of us ended up going there. Uh, and we're educated by the friars, so that's how I ended up being a Capuchin. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of reflecting here on the, the whole title of, of, of this uh, uh, exhortation, which is Joy of the Gospel. Mm -hmm. So um, somehow the Pope must see at the heart of all of this is, is joy. I mean, he's talking about really serious things here. I don't know, can you say anything about the relationship of what you've said to that whole notion of sure. joy? He's, he's talked a lot about, he's, in fact, in some, one of his homilies, he said the church doesn't need sour pusses. Uh, need people who can radiate the joy of the gospel. I think that's especially important when we are dealing with, with these types of uh, issues and this type of a call because some of the grimmest people you find um, in, in the church are people who are devoted to social justice. The, 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 the most seemingly unhappy people are the people that are, uh, and I suppose it's because they're reflecting on all the problems and everything like that. But, but the, the Pope really, he says, in order for us to really have the capacity to transform society, um, we have to be able to really be able to proclaim the, the gospel of Jesus as what it is, good news. That, that, that what Jesus is inviting the world to do, is inviting us to do, is going to bring greater happiness to the world. And, it's, and by the fact that we're believers, it's already bringing happiness to us. And so that's really what he's trying to emphasize. That the joy that in order to transform the world with the gospel, we have to be joyful in our proclamation of it. Uh, gentlemen in the back and then the back. It's been wonderful to hear uh, our concern for the poor, which I think we all are, and uh, wonderful that we've heard how the, our local church is helping the poor. 
I have a, a question outside that range when you talked about global warming and the poor, and I didn't quite get the connection. Okay, and what is the church doing in a way to uh, prevent global warming or diminish it? Sure. Uh, well, when, when, when he talks about global warming, uh, and I don't want to get into too much detail, but he's talking about things, for example, like deforestation, uh, which is wiping out many of the lands of indigenous peoples in different parts of the world and is contributing to, to global warming because it's uh, because of the, uh, the loss, the, the increase of greenhouse gases and, and so on. Um, but he's also talking about how, um, for example, the rise in sea levels is going to have the greatest impact on, on people who are living in, in developing countries. Uh, and that, that could have an impact. The, desert, the desertification is, is lessening the amount of arable land in the world and is, is, is creating more pressures uh, on food supplies. Um, that, that when, uh, it also leads to a loss of, of fresh water uh, for people. And many, many experts are saying now that the next wars are gonna be fought not over oil, but over access to water. And so he's, that's, what he's, that's what he's talking about. And so um, uh, what the church is, is trying to do, I mean, when you see um, in practical things, I, I think probably the, the, uh, there's, there's something called the Global Catholic Climate Movement uh, that's, that's um, being promoted right now. And it's a coalition of different, different people from different church groups that is, is, is right now gearing up to uh, create a more popular presentation of the Pope's encyclical on the environment um, in, the, in the coming months. Um, but you see it in practical ways too. And I have to say our religious women are among the leaders in energy conservation and promoting um, um, green building and so on and so forth. If um, you go to many of their houses, if you go to the mother house of the uh, IHM sisters in Monroe, Michigan, they, they invested a huge amount of money in building this green um, mother house uh, and renovating it. There's solar panels all over the place, there's gray water toilet systems and everything like that. Uh, they're going to be paying for it. You better hope that they live much longer than 78 because they're going to be paying for it for a long time. But, um, but, um, but they're, they're, they're leaders. Yes, sir. There's a The next crisis will be, in fact, uh, water. 70% of the Earth's surface is water. Only 3% of it is potable. Uh, two of those three percent are tied up in ice flows and so forth. So that leaves one percent. The thermodynamic answer to that, uh, which is going to be the salvation, is to have reverse osmosis to take the salt out of the salt water. In order to do that effectively, you've got to drop the entropy or the the attachment between the salt and the water molecule which now can be done by special membranes and so forth. The whole concept of uh, science is that it is constantly changing. And going back to Plato, a fact is universal, necessary, and certain. And the problem is with that word certain, which means forever. The president has said that this is settled science. There's so little of science that is settled that it's almost an oxymoron. The, the speed of light, that's settled. Sound, that's settled. Most other things are not settled, just like Newton's uh, motion. After 150 years, Einstein showed that the, that while it didn't overturn it entirely, it changed the dominion that it had over. Mm -hmm. This is not settled science, and in the Republic of Science, which is, you can think of just like any other republic, the data that is coming out is being 
is being manufactured. And a lot of it is not supportable. So I hope the Pope walks very, very carefully. Now one question I would ask you, in your uh, Indian in Montana, if that were a microcosm of society and the distributive justice, which has been better, the government or mendicant uh, charity? Wow, that's a tough question. Um, I, I think, first of all, to address your issue on science, I think I think you make you raise a good point. I mean, science, science as we know, just from from history and from our own uh, experience, is not permanent and it's not perfect. Um, but I think people people try to make decisions based on the, the what they perceive to be the best science available. And you're arguing that's not even the best science available. I understand that. But I think that's what the, the Pope is going to try to do in his uh, in his encyclical regarding the, um, the the history of Native American tribes in the United States and and the and uh, the mendicant orders and and uh, the government. Um, I have to say that it's a mixed bag. Uh, I think uh, and the, and the histories of the mendicant any of the orders or the religious orders or even the Protestant. Uh, churches and the government and the Indian schools, um, you know, is 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 mixed. Um, I think um, you have to go all the way back to the, the founding of the um, of the whole effort to um, uh, assimilate the Indian peoples, um, going back uh, many years, and um, that the cultural damage that that did um, to to many people. But also, when you talk to people on the reservation, they also, many of them uh, are also very grateful for the educations that they received, um, that their lives uh, were transformed by, by the educations that they received from the different religious orders and the different schools. Uh, and so it, I have to say, it's a, as I said, it's a mixed legacy. Um, that, and it plays itself out even today. Uh, two gentlemen. I'll go first. Oh, oh. There's a gentleman behind you with the mic. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, certainly, in that particular chapter that you spoke about, as it relates, dealt a lot with the economics. And um, it seems to me that in the history of, of proclaiming the gospel and dealing with justice issues, speaking of the Catholic Church, the Catholic uh, leaders were speaking out of the needs of the people. <coughs> the kind of economic justice remarks, unions supporting unions and whatnot. Today, it is very difficult because, as Pope said, capitalism has tamed religion. And many of our many of the people in our parishes are not the most vulnerable today. And economics and politics are influencing the direction and that we should be taking, even influencing science. We don't want to accept science because it might affect our jobs. Or corporate, corporations will spend a fortune trying to get across a message because it might affect their industry. I guess the question I'd be asking is, the seriousness of our economics affecting the implementation of this vision. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, uh, you know, that what, that's where the rubber hits the road. Uh, you know, I think we have to um, examine that on, on many different levels. Um, I, it's been a, it's really been a tension within the church and within living the gospel, if you even go back to the, um, the writings of St. Paul, and you, and you see tensions within the community. Uh, for example, in, in 1 Corinthians 11, you know, where, where um, there's, there's this whole discussion about uh, the celebration of the Eucharist and the divisions between the rich and the poor, and who gets to eat the fellowship meal and who doesn't get to eat the fellowship meal, and, and so on. And it's a very human, human thing, and I think what the, what, the Pope, what the Pope is encouraging, I think, in this in this apostolic exhortation 
is uh, not to give up on the on the dialogue because that's where the that's where the growth that's the growth comes. That's where the, the salvation is of implementing these things. So it's a point well taken. Yes, sir. You're gonna yes. okay. okay. Uh, in our inner city of Milwaukee, I understand that like most African Americans are not Catholic. I get that. Mm -hmm. But I don't understand and I understand, therefore, the closure of a lot of Catholic parishes in the inner city. Mm -hmm. But why can't Catholics maintain some sort of presence in the inner city? Mm -hmm. And I think of St. Martin de Poor and St. Ben's as being on the fringe of the inner city, mm -hmm. not the heart of the inner city. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, a, that's a question to uh, ask the Archbishop. <laughs> Uh, I you know I think it was raised at the when they were uh, having the meetings on the synod um, that that issue was raised um, and I think uh, it's something that uh, there are there are small projects and and things that are done in the different parts of the city uh, to help um, but um, you know I think one of the challenges that we have is that the, the parish has become the is the dominant model of Catholic presence uh, everywhere, and and so uh, I don't think we've we've developed the imagination uh, or or done enough experimentation, perhaps, to find other ways of the church being present um, in the in the central city. Now there are, other, of course, other institutions, Catholic hospitals, um, you know, soup kitchens and things like that 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 are there. Um, but I think that's uh, that's that's been an ongoing challenge. And of course, you know, historically, if you look at the history of, of, of black Catholics, particularly in northern urban areas, the one institutions that had the most impact on evangelization uh, were Catholic schools, uh, and we've closed most of those. Um, um, and and there, there's financial pressures on Catholic schools all over the place, not just in central cities, but but um, you know, I think the one thing that helps at least somewhat in Milwaukee, and even though it's controversial, is is choice. It's keeping some of those Catholic schools going in an environment where they otherwise would never have the opportunity. So. John, yes, John, say, say something. Um, out of the synod, um, the archbishop or the archdiocese said we have these four big areas we need to address moving forward, and one of those big areas is social justice. Mm -hmm. And to that end, the Archbishop has done two things that I think are really going to improve the Catholic presence in uh, the Central City. One of them is um, all four of those areas, there's a commission forming that's going to lead the dialogue and the, um, the work that the Archbishop, Archdiocese is going to do in these areas. And so social justice, there's a commission forming of folks from around the Archdiocese to really look at the areas of social justice and where we as an Archdiocese need to be more present and more involved. And there's some really good people, um, I'm involved in it, so myself excluded, but there's some other really good people who are going to be a part of this and really kind of guide, I think, the way the Archdiocese is going to move forward. The second thing that I would mention, and this is not a, um, this is not a um, officially public thing yet, but it's it's been released kind of quasi-public, and is that the Archbishop has just named a vicar of urban ministry. And so Father Tim Kiske, uh, of the local parishes here, is now the Vicar General for Urban Ministry in Milwaukee. And he will be focusing specifically on the city, the inner city of Milwaukee and Milwaukee only. And so the, the Archbishop recognized the need for his real presence, um, for Christ's presence in the central city, and has named a vicar to be able to work towards that end in a very practical and, and very intentional way. And so I think that's going to go a long way uh, towards... Um, repairing, I think, some of the damage that's that's occurred um, by the Catholic Church leaving, and, and we've obviously done a very poor job as a Catholic Church to be present in the central city, and so um, I think walking forward and, and having a person like Father Tim who can humbly come forward and say, we haven't been present, but we'd like to be, we'd like to re-engage, we'd like to do a better job, how can we collaborate, how can we be um, real, um, how can we bring our assets to a situation that really needs uh, support and how can we work together and be collaborative, get away from that 
potentially that, that, that model of parish and really just be um, parishioners and Catholics to be present in very intentional uh, and, and practical ways in the, in, the, in the city. So I think that'll, that'll move us towards that, um, move us in the right direction. And I, don't, and I certainly don't want to denigrate parishes, uh, having been a pastor of three of them. Uh, I, I, I see a lot of good work that goes on there, but the, the reality is in, in many urban areas, Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, even worse than Detroit, um, the parishes are so spread out. Uh, and, and many of the people who come to those parishes don't even live in the neighborhoods. They, they come in from outside. Uh, you know, when I was at St. Martin de Porres, we had people coming from as far north as Germantown and as far south as Caledonia uh, to be part of the parish, uh, uh, as well as neighborhood residents. But, but I think that's, that's a challenge, too, is, is the fact that they're just, just so far apart. Yes, sir. A month ago, we had a very nice presentation here. Uh, about the Crystal Ray project that uh, you may or may not know the about. Jesuits. Uh -huh. Yeah, and I think that's an important addition. Excellent, and, and they're doing wonderful work in many different cities. Uh, where I live in Chicago, about a, about a mile from our house is a Crystal Ray High School. Um, for those of you who aren't really familiar with it, it's a program that was started by the Jesuits, and it combines practical work experience uh, for the young people with, with their academic uh, knowledge and helps place them in jobs. Um, and it's uh, very successful in many parts of the world, uh, United States. And uh, here you have a Crystal Ray High School and a Nativity Gentleman uh, Middle School as well. All right, it's about 7.30, so we're going to wind up here. Um, I think John and I can both be around for a few more minutes to answer any questions that otherwise that folks have. But uh, I want to say thank you very much again for uh, for John for coming here, and I want to thank all of you for coming and uh, giving up some time of your evening to come and hear this. And uh, hopefully, uh, this re-energizes or continues your energy towards doing this work of social justice and Catholic social teaching. Um, we're working in our parishes to be more collaborative with the Catholic home and offer more opportunities. So hopefully, I can engage with you all. Uh, more in the future to do this work. Uh, but for now, I, I wish you peace and a good rest of your evening. And you know, everybody, the, the Catholic home, the wonderful, good Catholic institution that it is, has bingo going on down in the lower level. If, no one, if you have nothing to do tonight, but on a 